So thank you, uh, Tina, and thanks to everybody for uh, allowing me to uh, present. So I'm the principal investigator of what's called the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium, and inherited neuropathies are also sometimes uh, called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. And as we've gone through our, uh, the history of our consortium, we've had to develop uh, natural history studies, biomarkers, and gene identification uh, studies. And these are similar uh, concerns that really most of the consortia in the RDCRN have to deal with. And I'm just going to use our, our experience as an example of this. And let's see if I can figure out this. Uh, uh, my mouse, yeah, it works. So just, I just want to echo what Tina said, that these are uh, collaborations. I don't know if I can deal with this new uh, pointer. Let's see. I'm tempted to, for your benefit, I'm tempted to stay with my mouse and, unless I fail with it. <laughs> but uh, we could not do this work without partnerships with people who have inherited neuropathies, and we couldn't do the work without our uh, uh, patient advocacy groups who've worked with us throughout this. And I'm just going to list them, again, for that reason. So we have the Muscular Dystrophy Association. We have the Charcot-Marie Tooth Association. We have the Hereditary Neuropathy uh, Foundation. We have the CMT uh, Research Foundation. And we also have international uh, 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 advocacy groups, including Telethon from Italy and CMT UK. And again, none of what we have done with natural history studies uh, could have happened without the partnership of patients and without these groups. So before I get into actually talking about the natural history itself, I just want to introduce the diseases that we're discussing. So these are peripheral neuropathies. As I said, they're often called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. And these affect the nerves that have left the spine and go down to the feet and hands, and they cause progressive weakness, sensory loss, problems with balance, people have difficulty walking, doing fine movements of their hands, and we separate them into two large groups. In one group, the problem starts with genetic uh, uh, mutations in uh, Schwann cell genes, which are the genes that make myelin for the peripheral nervous system, and we call this group CMT1, and then there's a second group where the problem starts with uh, mutations in genes that affect uh, uh, neurons, and these are both motor and sensory neurons, and we call this group CMT uh, type 2. And up until 1991, nobody knew the genetic cause for any of these, but since uh, 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 1991, we have uh, different uh, mutations on genes throughout almost all of the chromosomes, and in fact, there are over 100 genetic causes uh, of CMT at the moment, although four types uh, constitute most of those patients. So when we started, our task is to figure out how these diseases progress. And this is what we call natural history studies. And since we use these terms loosely sometimes, I wanted to try to be precise about it. So when we say natural history, we're talking about the usual course of development of a disease or a condition. And so that sounds nice, but why is that important? Well, if a patient or a family comes to talk to us in the clinic and we've diagnosed them with a rare disease uh, like CMT, they want to know what's the likely progression with this disease. How is it going to uh, progress over time? Who's at risk in my family? And then we've also seen slides earlier uh, showing uh, advances in gene therapy and novel therapies, which were inconceivable uh, a few years ago. But it's important to be able to tell if those treatments work. And treatments may not instantly totally reverse a rare disease, uh, but they may alter the progression. And so you need natural history data to be able to know what the disease typically does so you can see if you're affecting that. And uh, again, as been mentioned uh, uh, before, this can't be done by people like me or other physicians. This has to be done in partnerships with patients and families because you need to see patients over years to be able to uh, uh, get this natural history uh, 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 data. 
and these diseases are rare. So I'm at the University of Iowa. My clinic isn't big enough to have enough patients of, rare, of a rare disease to really do the natural history uh, data. And this is where the RDCRN comes in because, because of that uh, uh, support we've been able to have the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium, which is a network of over 20 sites, uh, and we have centers throughout the world. The main support is from the uh, NIH, and it enables us to do what's hard to do with just regular research grants, which is to actually recruit patients over years, have them come back, and actually do the natural history uh, studies that we're interested in. So I thought I would just show you a couple of slides just to show you what the diseases uh, we see look like and some of the challenges we face in natural history data. So this is a little guy who's seven years old and who has a type of CMT type 2, which is called CMT 2A. And I think you can see he has difficulty walking. He's an extremely cute, talented uh, young guy. So this is him when he's age seven. But these diseases progress, and this is him at age 10. I was trying to get him to wear a Phillies hat, but I couldn't do that. <laughs> so you can see this is, these are progressive diseases. So some forms of CMT progress rapidly. But then I'm going to show you another uh, uh, a little child. And this uh, uh, young lady is also about uh, seven years old. And we had to give her this uh, bribe of a stuffed bear to be, get permission to shoot this film. And she's doing a little better than the last child I showed you, but she still has problems with balance. She, that's as fast as she can run. She, uh, but this type of CMT, called CMT1A, doesn't progress at the same rate. And so I'm going to show you an older patient, patient in his 40s, with the same disease. And there is variability, but this is how most patients with CMT1A progress. So he, on the face of it, looks like he's doing pretty well, but he can't walk without AFOs, without falling. He has limited uh, use of fine movements with his hands, so at work he's in, unable to really uh, achieve his potential. But this is a slowly progressive uh, form of CMT. So the challenge to us is to figure out how to look at all of these patients, and as clinical trials for both of the forms I've showed you are actually occurring or about to occur, we needed to have ways to assess the natural history here. And the way we do that is with what's called clinical outcome assessments. These are measurements that are done in the clinic by uh, members of the different uh, sites I showed you. They're cross-trained on all of them. And I'm going to just show you some examples of these. The first ones uh, I'm going to show you is called a composite scale. And this is something that can be done quickly in the clinic as part of a routine exam. And uh, then I'm going to go through some functional scales and patient reported outcomes. So for the composite score, we call this the CMT neuropathy score. And I'm just going to show it to you quickly in the interest of time. Uh, but this is a score that has nine components. It has the first three that are in yellow are symptoms that or functional symptoms which, by which how the disease affects people. So they may not be able to use their hands to button clothes. They may need to wear AFOs or use a, a, a walker to uh, get around. That's captured in the symptoms. The green items are, thing, are findings on the routine neurological exam that you can quantify that look at nerves going to muscles or to the sensory organs that have to do with balance or feeling touch. And then the last in blue are sizes of waves on the nerve conduction velocity. And so because this can be done as part of the clinic, we've been able to do this in thousands of patients uh, and get 
good longitudinal data on at least the main types of CMT and for some of the others. That's helpful to help for us to understand progression, but it's not adequate to do clinical trials. And what we have done, and I don't expect you to read this, but this is what consortia have to do as they try to interpret natural history data and get ready for clinical trials. So you have to partner with agencies who you're going to be working with in the future with the trials. So we met with the FDA in what's called a critical path uh, innovation meeting just to make sure we're all on the same wavelength as what's going to be needed to actually look at uh, treatment and clinical trials. And one of the things that the uh, FDA uh, worked with us on is the need to develop functional scales. These aren't as quick to do. They may take 20 minutes in more of a research setting, but these are necessary. And I showed you pictures of children. We need to have outcome instruments that we can use in childhood. So because of this, we've developed what's called the CMT pediatric scale. And on this, we look at uh, hand function. We look at balance. We look at how kids do on a six-minute walk. We look at functions that get impaired by CMT. And because I'm an expert in the field, I am smart enough to know that what a four-year-old can do is different than what a 20-year-old can do. So that's, you know, the product of many years of education. So what we've done to deal with that, and I say we, but this is done by one of our sites in Australia. Because of the RDCRN, we can be international. And so our colleague Josh Burns put together a 1,000 individuals in what's called the uh, 1,000 Norms Project of all different ages and got normative data for all what we need to do on that functional outcome scale. And then he developed a uh, online calculator where if you click on this icon with the results you get from that functional study, it gives you what are called Z-scores, which are how uh, uh, findings vary from the normative population. And you get a score from 0 to 44 that's sex-matched and age-matched. And we've been able to take this into adults also with something called the CMT functional outcome measure and uh, more recently, we've also been able to move this into infants because we know what infants are supposed to do from birth up to the age of three or four in terms of when they roll over, when they start to walk, when they can reach out and pinch or grasp. And we've been able to uh, put together a CMT infant scale, which is a functional scale. And so we have functional scales for people with CMT now throughout the lifetime. But there's still a failing uh, in really having these clinical outcome assessments be totally what we need because we're missing still what in many ways is the most important component. Because all of those scales have been built on what physicians and caregivers think, but they haven't been built on what patients think. And so that's why we put together what's called the CMT Health Index, which is a patient-reported outcome measure. And because of the way the uh, RDCRN is set up with the Data Management Coordinating Center, we have what are called patient contact registries where people can go online and join the contact registry for their various consortium. And so what we've done is we sent out questionnaires through the contact registry. We've gotten that data, and we've uh, put it together to develop a partial instrument We've tested that on a pilot population, gone through it again with people who have CMT, and now we have uh, the CMT uh, health index, which is a patient-reported outcome measure. So again, these are the type of approaches that are needed to really look at uh, the natural history of uh, uh, patients clinically with a rare disease, with rare diseases like CMT. But there is more that we needed to do because we also have to be able to determine whether potential treatments can target the protein or the gene that it's supposed to. Some of the outcome, some of the natural history studies for the slower progressive diseases take years to do in a clinical trial if you just use the clinical outcome assessment. So we, need to look, we needed to look for ways 
with biomarkers for changes that might be more sensitive to change, which correlated with the clinical outcome assessments, but would have let us get in early to see if a potential treatment was uh, getting uh, an effect. And I'm just going to show you three quick examples of what we've been doing here. So the first is to look at skin. Uh, just two minutes, okay? Uh, that uh, the skin has nerve cells in it, and I showed you that slowly progressive form of CMT, uh, which is CMT1A, which is caused by too much of a gene called peripheral myelin protein 22. And you can go into with a skin biopsy, and you can measure the amount of Schwann cell genes that are being expressed. So here's PMP22 and in a patient with CMT1A, and here are controls. This is another myelin gene that's not affected in the disease called myelin basic protein. There's no difference between the patients and controls. And then if you normalize the values to a part of the uh, Schwann cell that's not affected in myelin, you can really separate these out. So now we have a biomarker for target engagement. This is an axon. This is a, what a peripheral nerve looks like. When this degenerates in CMT, it releases a protein called neurofilament, neurofilament light. You can measure that as a biomarker that correlates with disease severity. And finally, you can look in muscles, and this is a calf muscle, this is the bone, this is muscle, and this little white bit here is fat within the muscle, and that increases with nerve damage over time and severity, and you can calculate that and you can calculate that in such a way that you can, in the most slowly progressive forms of CMT, you can uh, determine change just within a year with uh, very high uh, uh, significance. And the last slide I'm going to show you is to say, well, that's fine for the types of CMT that you know. And these are genetically diagnosed because the genetic problem is at the heart of the disease. But there are people who still aren't genetically diagnosed so we've been able to use our network, which is worldwide, to identify uh, many of the novel genes that have been discovered in recent years, and we're still doing that. And this is just a list of the CMT genes that have been discovered in the last uh, five or six years, and all of these in purple or brown here have been discovered through uh, the INC RDCRN. Again, only possible with the support from uh, on the NIH. So. These are the groups that have been part of the uh, uh, Inherited Neuropathy Consortium over the last uh, a few years. And I'm sorry to have rushed a little bit at the end, but I wanted to uh, finish on time, so thank you.